And here we are. I am joined once again by Shaldo, which I nicknamed one of the UK's hardest working rappers. And, you know, since we spoke back in God, September 2019, I think it was, so it's ages ago, since then, you've just worked even more and more. So <laughs> I feel like change always change the episode name of that one, because this one would be fairly apt. Um, but, you know, you've just been doing a lot of stuff, both in your uh, music career and outside of it. So um, just how are you doing, basically? I'm good. You know, funnily enough, you say that, but I feel like I've been working less hard and more smart. I've certainly mm. been enjoying the process a lot more um just because i'm not killing myself to release music and to pay for everything and so on and so forth it just feels like i'm able to enjoy the experience of releasing music and building a fan base more so than i did when i was actually you know reportedly the hardest working rapper (laughs) yeah i mean obviously with uh covid and things that really changed how a huge amount of uh, musicians had to work but with yourself you already had that level of sort of brand recognition to a degree but because you did relative, well, pretty much everything yourself and you not <clears throat> only had your music but you've got your manga and you've got really cool merch and things and because you've got these layers and i think when we spoke before you said um you know you didn't want the shortcut you know if someone <laughs> has that one track that explodes and then you're a one-hit wonder you're kind of yeah. trailing behind that forever but if you build up consistently over time and you find your footing and you find your lane then the fans that you find stay with you so mm. so linking in with that obviously your music style has changed somewhat as the the years have gone by and from your previous album uh way of the shall that was um you really found your stride so i just want to ask uh the process of that from when you were started to kind of where you are now how how you found yourself in essence in the music uh do you know what i i just started rapping about things that interested me more I've always been very much into anime, manga, gaming, let's call it nerdy stuff. And um, it just seemed that that wasn't the the sort of appropriate thing that a rapper should rap about. At the most, you'd make mention of it or have a clever metaphor or punchline involving an anime character. But that was it, Mm. you know, leaning fully into it. um, I think the first time I did it was with Kaioken. Mm. and you know that was very fun to 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 film and record and everything like that but it didn't really do that much career-wise and then Nani just happened to be a track that I merged English and Japanese with and that exploded in terms of support and recognition and everything like that and of course I'm going to go where the where the appreciation is and if people enjoy hearing that style of music from me and hear me enjoying myself on a record by talking about things that I love, then yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've got no issue with doing that. It's, it's certainly no compromise of my integrity. Mm. Um, otherwise that would be more of a serious consideration, but I, I've just leaned more into other aspects of my personality. Mm. And who would have thought like when you started your career in music, like that your intrigue in Japanese and obviously all of the, since when we spoke last time, you know, we end up going on a big tangent and talk about anime for like most of the conversation, but who knew your ability to speak Japanese would merge so well with your rap style and also for the audiences that listen and a lot of the collaborations you've been doing as well i think it's really helped elevate you among rappers not only is your rapping in english really cool but i've noticed on a lot of youtube videos and when i see comments of people who haven't heard you before they go oh wow this this is something i haven't heard before mm. so with was nanny something that you specifically was like i'm just going to do this uh track with a bit of japanese in it because i want to and it's fun or was there another influence that made you do that um, I think it started for me from the Charlie Sloth Fire in the Booth, mm. where I rapped a little bit in Japanese and people really responded to that. But then I purposefully didn't do any more because I, I remember saying this to a friend, I didn't want to come across as a gimmick or mm. gimmicky with it. And I needed to prove myself as an artist regardless of what I viewed to be a crutch in terms of, you know, just speaking random Japanese in my verse. Um, and then Nani came along and I heard the track and it just seemed that that was the chorus, you know, the, I, I was listening to the track and the word Nani was coming into my head. And I thought, well, yeah, I've got to, if I'm going to use that word, then really I've got to include some Japanese in it. And so I did that and got the reaction that I got. And I, I think I had to let go of that um, self-depreciating thought process, which was, you know, it's a gimmick to rap in Japanese. if 
I'm putting in genuine work and effort into learning it, appreciating the culture, uh, really studying the language, which I am, you know, I'm taking lessons and everything like that and really putting a lot of time into um, getting the language right so that I can, I can represent it authentically. So um, it, with me, it would never be a gimmick because I would always appreciate and respect anything that I'm doing. But I suppose I was worried that people would view me as a one trick pony or as somebody who, who, who could only get attention by rapping in Japanese. Mm. So, you know, I've, I've tried to try to measure it out carefully. And whilst I'm, you know, whilst I'm learning, it's, it's the, um, what they call it, the Dunning-Kruger effect, where before I started the university lessons, I was like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting this. this. It all makes sense. Then I started the university lessons. I'm like, nope, this language is actually really difficult. <laughs> and now I'm getting back to a point where I'm like, okay, I, I kind of get it but it's a lot more difficult than I first envisioned. So um, whereas I I would have taken more chances with the language and been, and been comfortable to be wrong just because I wouldn't know that I was being wrong with it. Now it's a lot more difficult because I know where I'm going wrong with certain phrases. So I need to be even more careful, but that just means that the Japanese is even more accurate and still rhymes with the English and still makes sense. Mm. So as you're speaking Japanese more in your music, you're not only growing as a musician and an artist, but also your language is growing, which is a very, it's very good to sort of see that. And yeah. link, linking in with that, one of the things that the collaborations we have to speak about is a uh, Shaggy Ball Z mm. uh, versus One Jump Man. And one of the things I've got to say, I'll put links in the description because people need to check out um, bo both of the parts that you're in, but also, you know, the, the YouTube channel Mashed, which I didn't realize is by Channel 4, which is baffling yeah. too. I did not expect that when I saw it. I was like, Mashed? I was like, is this like... For me, I thought, was it something relating to... Um, the vibes I got initially was... Oh, um, I should have really remembered what the name of it was. It's um, yeah, Game Grumps, one of the members, Ninja Sex Pie. Right, right. You know, and they've released an album and they've done a lot of... Uh, um, animated stuff as well to do mm -hmm. with sort of nerd culture in that way so i was like oh is mash like maybe part of them but i was like oh channel four that's interesting but one of the things quite, that I, quite random huh yeah it's uh, i would not have guessed i mean yeah. channel four are very progressive in a lot of ways but i didn't realize they had a youtube presence of, of that regard so i want to say that with the youtube video uh with the track itself one of the things that i love the most is the obviously you're speaking in English when you're doing Shaggy, but when mm -hmm. you do Luigi or One Jump Man, you speak in Japanese, and obviously yeah. Nintendo is a Japanese company. And I just thought that was so clever. So I want to ask with Shaggy Ball Z, how did that collaboration come about with Mashed, and just wh where does it come from, basically? Well, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mashed's work, and they um, obviously did the Waluigi series uh, it was a three-part series about waluigi complaining that he wasn't in smash hmm. so and that was uh by kevin bennett who is an incredible rapper um and it just so happened you know i got in contact with Mash and and said you know i'm a big fan of what you do and i would love to love to contribute in some way if i can you know i'd love to work with you guys and they came back to me said yeah you know we're actually a uk company not many people know that and we we've been hoping to work with some uk with a uk rapper for a while so it's a good thing you got in contact so we kind of went from there it took a little while to get it all sorted but we went from there and um they asked me to pitch a couple ideas which i did they liked some of them but they they came back and said you know actually we've got these two series shaggy ball z and one jump man that we've been wanting to do something with for a while and we think that music would work very well with it and would quite like to merge these two together can you do something with this so they provided me with a, a rough overview script and asked me to put a song together which i did and they loved it and kind of went from there and now it's looking like it's going to be at least a five-part series so um yeah part three we're starting work on at the moment um so yeah in essence uh it, it's been really fun to work on it because it's something i've always wanted to do with my career you know work on animated material and just make cool music and artistry and in terms of the in terms of the Japanese English thing, I just thought it would be funny to have this character that understands not a word of English, just trying to get along and everybody's misconstruing what he's saying to them. And um, it allows me to flex my Japanese skills in a legitimate way that um, makes sense for the story. So, yeah, it's, it's tough trying to get uh, one jump man to, to contribute in meaningful ways whilst also having the Japanese rhyme. But so far, it's been a challenge that I've enjoyed. And it's, it's always really funny to me when people, um, when people say, oh, but Luigi is Italian. Why is he speaking Japanese? And I'm like, well, 
it's because he's not Luigi. It's it's one jump man. He looks like Luigi, <laughs> but it's one jump man. And one jump man is Japanese. Amazing. And with that as well, I want to ask, with the um, how it works, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I want to delve a smidge deeper. When it comes to, um, they give you, say, a, a general script. So how does, as much as you can tell us about the process, like, is it, you get the general script, you kind of, you write down your lyrics and record your verses, you send it to them back and forth, and then they say, okay, and then you don't hear anything, and then you get to see the video upon its release, or where do you get to see the animation? I'm just intrigued where the animation and your lyrics kind of where they connect in essence so yeah you're correct i write the lyrics first and we we have several meetings discussing the general direction the script so on and so forth but really um the the over the overarching um the well the overarching story they kind of say where they'd like it to go but the details and how we get to that point is largely up to me mm. so you know I, I i really do get a lot of creative freedom which is very very cool of them um so yeah i mean with 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 part one they just said they wanted you know um a big fight in a stadium at some point one jump man would do something to offend shaggy ballsy and then they would end up fighting and um maybe there'd be a draw at the end some big monster would come out at some point so on and so forth so i had to take all of that and make that something coherent and 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 you know something that made sense um, so when that's done, I send them over the song, they listen and then they, they create what's called an animatic, which is a very, very rough, um, version of the animation where it's almost like stick figures, drawn faces and things like that. Um, there's a little arrows and notes as it goes by, but it kind of plays as an animation would still, it's just incredibly rough. And I get to see the animatic. I don't know if normally most artists, I don't know if normally they would show the artist the animatic, but I find that kind of stuff interesting. So I've made it very clear. I'd love to see the process. So the, the my main contact there, he will send me any and everything that they have along the way up until it's pretty much done, at which point I say, I don't want to see it until it's released, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I enjoy that when, when it when it gets to the colored parts when when they're doing the color and the the proper drawings that's when i stop asking to see it just and maybe a few stills or a few shots here and there just because i want to experience the whole thing um when it's done that's amazing and i love one of the things i love about it is not only you you do so many references in so much of your music which is brilliant so you can just listen again and again and again and pick up more and more things and it's the same with watching shaggy mm. Z because when i watched it the uh, i think it's, it's either the first or second time and you see uh, in the first episode of it you are in the crowd which i loved yeah. i love little things like that and i was like oh my god there's an animated shaldo yeah, yeah. little things like that so anyone who hasn't seen the video needs to check it out but anyone who's already watched it go watch it again just look around the background because there's there's so many fun little there's puns. a lot of stuff there's a lot of stuff and i i can't take any credit for that whatsoever that's the animator liam who um is probably as big as if not a bigger nerd than me and really knows his stuff so it's it's always a joy for me like um part two contains a lot of jojo references and it takes a couple watches and even if you know jojo well you might still miss a few of them but there, there's just some really good stuff in there and what they're starting to do now is harken back to some of their earlier videos so they're creating what the the audience have dubbed the mashed cinematic universe which that i think is great. that's so cool i mean it's it's one thing that i think we touched upon it before but sort of centering in on it a bit more is like collaboration mm. you know and in a lot of your um singles and obviously in your albums and things you have done numerous collaborations over your career and as a podcaster although we're in slightly different mediums it's mm. still something that i believe is one of the most valuable things of being a content creator because i just think that when you work with someone else even it doesn't matter how small or big the collaboration necessarily is, but both parties seem to take something away. And obviously mm -hmm. if you can combine audiences that ends up adding even more. And I just think collaborations in themselves are just so important for so many working individuals who aren't, you know, immediately gigantic, massive, famous sort of uh, artists or podcasters. And I think that this perfectly encapsulates how, well collaborations can go with people who are like-minded enough but still yeah. have individual skills and you can create so many cool things not you know not just uh, the things that you've been involved with but everything that mash do is building that thing up and i think i just really respect that and also your input into that realm mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um yeah I, I for me it's just about creating cool stuff like i said you know i just want to do the things that i dreamed about doing when i was starting my career and so far, you know, I feel very blessed to have done some of those things. There's still a lot more, but, 
if I could tell myself, my younger self, what I would be doing now, he would be incredibly impressed and excited. So, you know, that's some of it really that's kind of enough for me, but it's also not enough for me because I want more. <laughs> that's kind of how I feel. Whenever I get like a really, uh, like a guest I've been chiming for for ages and really excited yeah. about, I'm like, oh, I'm so happy yeah. I got them. And then I speak to them and afterwards I'm like, but I'm not done. Yeah. <laughs> now I need to get the next person and stuff. Yeah. So speaking of sort of collaborations and sort of dreams in a lot of ways, when we were first speaking um, back in the, the prior podcast we did, obviously you on your um, last album, you had the song, I believe it was Don't Box Me with yeah. uh, Chris Calico. Yes. And yes, obviously yes. he is, uh, or was a major player of strange music. And we spoke about, uh, Tech Nine and obviously Tech Nine. And you've said in multiple interviews as well has been a massive influence to you in so many yeah. ways. And then when I saw it, get, I think it was about a year ago now or so, but when I saw that you were doing a collaboration with Tech Nine, I mean, I don't know. I, I want to hear how you were feeling, but when I saw that, I was like, I, cause I saw, I saw you support Tech Nine in yeah. the UK. That's how we kind of, I first heard of you and I saw you and I was like, I love this guy's energy. I want to get in contact. And that's how we um, end up speaking and things. So how was that to finally, after to like playing shows with him in the UK and having a song with Chris Calico, finally, and not only having a single released sort of under your name featuring Tech Nine, like the Chris Calico thing was, but the reverse that you yeah. are on a Tech Nine album. I mean, that's. Yeah. That's incredible. And kudos to you, sir. It's a Thank brilliant you. track. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's indescribable, really. I mean, sometimes I kind of forget it just to get through my day, because if I think about it too much, it's like, wow, you know, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, and really, he just called me out of the blue and said, I've got a track I think I could hear you on. Would you like to do it? And I'm like, well, duh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, it was kind of like that. And it was really cool to be able to talk to him and just be involved in the process and my only regret was that i was meant to fly out to the states to film the video with him and we couldn't do it because of covid mm. so you know i was supposed to be quite heavily featured in the video and it's really really unfortunate that i wasn't but um you know time will tell and fingers crossed there will be more in the future i, I don't know but um you know just to be able to say that i was on a tech nine album in and of itself is incredible so i'm really really mm. happy with that and the song itself is amazing. It's called A Kickata, and I'll make sure I put a link to that in the description as well uh, for anyone to, so they can see the video, but also so they can hear the track itself. And, you know, I... I, I I like Tech Nine, but he, he releases so much music a lot of the time. It's kind of mm. sometimes you release an album, I'm like, it's so overwhelming. But when yeah. when that album came out, I think that your track with Tech was actually one of the standouts. Oh, and I listened to it over and over again. I think it's it's fantastic. And when it comes to sort of the, the process, obviously he pro probably he had the majority of the track sorted. Was it kind of like because I don't fully I don't really know how collaborations, especially uh, in rap music, work. Is it he basically said, I've you've got this 30 seconds say whatever you want what did he have a theme like as much as you can say about it i'm just very intrigued by it yeah so he he kind of said that he had written this song and he could hear me all over he could hear me on the hook mm -hmm. and so um he sent it he sent it over to me and it had the space already he already had the verses and he gave me a general thought process of of where he was going with the track the kind of energy he wanted the kind of idea he wanted for the chorus he said he wanted it to have a worldwide feel that kind of thing something international and so immediately i thought well it needs to have some japanese in there in that case um and yeah it had it had the space on it and i just sat there that evening from when he sent it to me and worked on it worked on it until i got it sent it back to him sent him some ideas back and forth until we had something he was happy with and then i just jumped in the studio and recorded it um it's different for different artists. Some artists will send you just a song, completely blank instrumental and give you some ideas and so on and so forth. And you kind of work it together. Sometimes they will have already re recorded the key parts on it and then send that over to you. It's different. You know, um, I think that it depends on the, on, on the stage of the process you're at. Sometimes you will have a beat and you'll just hear it and be thinking, okay, well, I'd really like to get this artist on it. Let me send it to them whilst the idea is still fresh. Sometimes you might be writing something, get to a point and think, actually, this needs somebody else on it. Who do I get? Oh, okay, maybe this person. Let me send them what I've got so far. Mm. Yeah. And one of the things as well, uh, just to sort of partly finish off the, the Tech Nine discussion is uh, when I heard about the song and I was like, oh, that's amazing. That's so cool. And then it was a single as well which yeah. also was like obviously because you said about the video and things as yeah. well i was like that's even more of a of a massive deal and i think it was it was either the first or second single from the album i seem to recall first single first single yeah so it was just like that's 
what a way to kick off a new Tech Nine album yeah. of just having you on it. And I, it just made me happy as well. Not only that you got to uh, perform with such an incredible artist and obviously mm-hmm. someone who I've always associated you with tech, especially from uh, where, how I was introduced to you. But the fact that so many new fans who like Tech Nine's music we we'll hear from you. And it's not just like, you know, you're not that this wouldn't be impressive anyway, but it's not mm. like you're on, you know, the 13th track of a 16 track album kind of hidden away. You are yeah. front and center, first yeah. track, everyone hears it. And it's yeah. just, I was happy for you just for that degree of exposure. Thank you. So, yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. It, and it was a complete honor, you know? So um, it's, it's really just trying to get to the point where um, I have something to offer tech in terms of putting him him on my album and he's like oh my gosh i'm on a shadow album that's that's what i want <laughs> i'm sure you'll get there one day um but w- linking in with that sort of i want to speak to you about your releases and whatnot um because as we said your last album came out uh, before we started speaking a little while ago but that doesn't yeah. mean you haven't been releasing stuff obviously we've already spoken about uh, shaggy ball z but also you've been releasing every few months there's been a new single out from you some of them have been sort of uh relating to uh more heavily in the nerdy stuff like there's the song mm. uh sephiroth what i absolutely adore uh, that's of those and like dio brando and a lot of the sort of more heavily involved in nerddom and anime the the sephiroth song i think for me was one of my favorites of that but then you're still also releasing music that isn't explicitly in that realm songs mm. like Cursey, and so i want to ask you um what is the process? And you're releasing, I think you said, an EP at some point in this year, ideally. So what is the kind of, what has made you choose to release singles consistently as opposed to uh, saving up for an album? Like, what was your process of your releasing schedule, in essence? In all honesty, it's just easier uh, mm. because my process is very intricate and very meticulous. You know, I, I spend a good amount of time writing until I'm completely satisfied and I can stand by every single word that I've written and I've thought and considered every line and really thought, you know, is this the best I can do? Okay. Yes. Move on to the next line. Okay. Is this the best I can do? Now maybe let me move this word. Let me change this the to an, uh, and stuff like that, you know? Um, so once I've, once I'm there, I want people to hear it and to do that for say five, six tracks for an EP or, 12 to 15 tracks for an album or however much and not be releasing music in the meantime i think would stress me out a little bit just because i know people are are waiting and and in the in the community that i'm in the nerdcore community the expectation is that you're releasing tracks maybe once a week if not once every two weeks whereas i'm out here releasing a track every month or so or whenever i feel like it so there's already a bit of a delay in my process so then to wait three four five however months it takes to put together a body of work, I just worry that I'll lose some of the momentum that I've built up. Plus, I genuinely enjoy uh, the, the the single process at the moment, you know, creating the music video, creating the artwork for it. I'm I'm so proud of the artwork for Erin Yeager for Dead because I, I genuinely think that's the best artwork that I've had so far. Mm. And, you know, for an EP or an album, you get one piece of artwork for the whole project, assuming you're not releasing any singles from it. So... Yeah, I I just enjoy the representation of the music in single format. And even to be honest, even if I did release an EP or an album, I would probably still showcase the individual tracks as singles up until a point. So um yeah, for my honest answer is for the time being, I'm just enjoying putting out good music as regularly as I possibly can. Uh maybe I might get to the point where I've created a bit of a backlog and I've got a couple tracks done and then I can start thinking about an EP. But for now whilst people are just enjoying what i'm putting out i'll just i just want to put stuff out really mm. yeah because with singles you really get that time with it as you say yeah. you get the time to you know you perfect the track and whatever and the artwork and etc but then when you release it it doesn't get overlooked because there's certain <clears> tracks like you know I, I mentioned it i keep mentioning it but on way of the shower don't box me with chris calico that is one of my favorite tracks of yours yeah. and obviously it's the last track on the album i think from what i can recall is, and i would yeah. worry that people you know, especially in today's society, there's so many friends I have who are like, oh, yeah, I love this artist. Like, oh, cool. Do you listen to this album with this album? Oh, no, I've just listened to singles. I'm like, what are you doing? You're insulting yeah, yeah. me. But when you, so it's kind of certain fans will miss out certain tracks. Yes. A lot of the time, like really strong tracks can be 
not hidden, but you know, in the middle of an album or two thirds through. And if you release them single, one at a time, you release it, you get time, your fans can sort of respond to it, you can hear what they liked about it, what they didn't, and it can help you attune your craft. Whereas if you spend a year and a half and you're quiet in air quotes because you're releasing an album, and mm. then you release the album, it is not uh except it's not sort of um people don't like it as much as maybe one would expect. And then you've kind of got the back and forth process you don't have as much whereas yeah. when you release one single at a time you just really get that time for it yes yeah and you know i i think you i as you identified we're very much in a different kind of world that than we were when cd albums and singles and things like that were were dominating you know it is a far more transient and and um instant gratification type society and I think you, you know, you either move with the times or, or you get left behind. So I'm aware that people have shorter attention spans and they, they don't have the time to really be checking out and, and listening to a whole album. So when I, whilst I'm not ready to make an album, whilst I don't feel that I've got something to say on an album, there's no point in me doing one. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. And also it's it's interesting as well because some some of your newer fans may not realize like sort of how long you've been in the industry for. And obviously when we spoke last time you were speaking about, you know, you used to just as either for gigs or otherwise just you would be out yourself selling your merchandise selling physical cds and now sort of years down the line it's it's completely changed i know friends of mine who don't even have a means to play a cd anywhere they, they don't have a player not on their laptop in their car or anything so it is that kind of thing where pretty much everyone has got a smartphone now in sort of western society and so when you've got those things where people, as you say, there's instant gratification, people forget things immediately. I talk to my friends and I showed them a song and they're like, oh yeah, I love that song. And I'm like, oh, have you heard the other singles that come out? Oh, there are other singles. It's like, yes, it's been eight months. There's more yeah. music that's come out since now. Like, I completely forgot. I listened to that, liked it, put it in a playlist and then never delved any deeper. Mm -hmm. So I think with the, the single part, especially, you know, uh, we are coming out of COVID, you know, there are gigs playing and things. And I know that you did a small tour recently, um, a small tour, you did a tour recently, and it was in my hometown and I couldn't attend, which made me very sad. Um, but fear not, I will attend another one. Um, but obviously during COVID, it was that thing where there was no live shows. There was yeah. a degree of, you know, the Zoom live shows. And I know that like a band I like called Architects, they played in the Royal Albert Hall and you paid money to be able to watch them. But obviously seeing them on a screen do live performance isn't the same as... No being there and the atmosphere and especially with yourself when you've got tracks like dropkick man yeah like when i first saw you one of the things that i immediately clicked with you i found was that you had such good command of a crowd which for an opening act is not that common and mm. so I, I commend you on that but i want to ask like how was it after being in covid being able to play a few live shows again like how was that was it quite cathartic for you like were you like jonesing for it and needing it or was it a bit kind of nerve-wracking yeah, it was awesome. I, I really missed being on stage. You know, it's it's very much something that I love doing. And the London show in particular, uh, the, London, the London show of the tour was one of my favourite shows that I've done. Mm. So, you know, that that was awesome. Um, but I am a live artist. You know, I don't I, I don't perform online because it, you, there's no crowd. There's no energy there for me. You know, so um, I'd always said that if the live music industry was going to migrate exclusively to online. I don't think I would make music in the same way just because it's, it's not, it's not for me, you know, mm. performing to a screen is just not what I do. So um, yeah, it was, it was definitely needed. I think to return to, to live, not just for me, but for a lot of people to be able to come out of their house and see a show. Um, so I'm just hoping that people start feeling more confident, start feeling more comfortable to go outside and, and experience live music because there's nothing really like it. You can't get that same effect or experience by watching it at home on a computer or screen or, or phone screen, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. It's one of the reasons I didn't tune into any any artist that I liked, um, whether it was free or otherwise. I was just like, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't want to sit in front of a computer and watch you perform for an hour and a half because, you know, it sounds somewhat reductive it's like if i'm going to sit there and listen to you i'd rather listen to you studio where generally speaking it sounds more clean but obviously when you're live it's not about it sounding clean it's about mm. variations of the tracks it's about uh, in sort of interacting with the performer it's about seeing the performer there it's the atmosphere of the crowd so there's so many layers to live performance that you just 
don't get when you watch it on uh, on a screen. And even if you watch someone, say, uh, play in front of a crowd, like older videos and things, you do get a percentage of that, but it's it's still nowhere near. So I, I'm completely in agreement with you there, where I, mm. me watching uh, artists that I liked, it's not it's not the same for me. So being a performer, not feeling the energy bounce back off the crowd, it it would be a very bizarre thing, I could imagine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So, and I want to ask as well with sort of uh, keeping in line with streaming. Um, so obviously a lot of people are, I think, peripherally aware that when people have music on Spotify and other streaming services, that the amount that artists get paid per listen is an unfathomably small amount. But mm. I know that you are, you know, very honest and outspoken about these sort of things. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about streaming and your opinions on it and some of the things that you've said in interviews and whatnot about the kind of state of it all and how you yeah. where you kind of want it to go i i mean i just think that in a in a in an industry where people can make such incredible music the fact that most musicians can't even make a living from their music because it's just not paid well enough is is criminal mm-hmm. um whereas the record labels and all the other industry uh, professionals and the people who work within the music business are able to command and draw a a livable living. The people who actually are the reason that there is even a music business are not. And that is very strange to me. Uh, as to how to fix that, I don't know. Aside from talking about it and encouraging people to support their favourite artists in lots of different ways and not just by streaming it, but by going to shows, by buying merch, uh, by you know really supporting the artists and telling new people about them in the hopes that you know the streaming numbers will get to a point where it actually pays anything half decent but yeah I, I i just think that it's it's a real shame that you can't just make music and make money from that for the for probably about 80 to 90 percent of artists that's the case for some it's not and more power to them well done congratulations but even still they should be being paid more for their music than they are being paid. So uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough mm-hmm. one. But, you know, uh, I think a million plays on, on Spotify is about £4,000, which is, you know, it's a million plays. Yeah. And it, it, as you say, there's often with people, they take the cuts and things and how much yeah. is Spotify making off this from people either paying the monthly fees or when you people have the free versions and the adverts and stuff, you think, yeah, how much money are they making and mm. stuff? And you hear about the, you know, I, I do listen to Joe Rogan, but you hear about how much he got paid to put his music on Spotify. And you're just thinking, there's so many small artists that could yeah. really probably have used that money distributed a bit more. And you yeah. give it to one of the, if not the richest podcast in the entire world, and you give him even more money. And it's like, uh, you know, I'm not obviously uh, the leader of the, the business side of Spotify. I'm sure for them it made sense. But uh, that left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. It's mm-hmm. always kind of like, the, and this is a slightly tangent bit. It's kind of one of those things that frustrates me when you get people who are ridiculously rich. They often get things for free and get yeah. more stuff. So it's kind of like, oh, you're already a rich, famous celebrity. Well, here's a here's free stuff here's for more. this. Yeah. yeah, and it's this weird thing where you've all, these people could afford this stuff and you're giving it to them for free. Yeah. Whereas these people could really use it, they don't get it. It's a really bizarre, it is, bizarre thing. It is, yeah, I've always said people like to help people who don't need help. Mm. That's a very good way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. And sort of linking in with that as well, with your your merchandise and things, is you've got your manga and you've got volume one of that out. And uh, to my knowledge, you're already writing it in the process of uh, volume two. So I want to ask just about, I'll, I'll put a link in the description as well for your uh, merch store and things. And I just want to ask about your merchandise and your manga itself. Like, tell us a little bit about those things. Um, so yeah, it's just cool stuff that I personally would wear. Um, it's being sold by me really, uh, is pretty much my merch, you know, almost everything that I sell, I would wear. And if I saw it out and about, I'd be like, that's kind of cool. I wouldn't mind buying that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's authentically me. And, um, the manga series is set in a world where musicians have special powers and abilities that grow as their fan base increases. So it's just me telling but it's kind of it's kind of an autobiography just with a lot more fantasy and fictional elements in it uh but it's the perfect medium for me to tell my story because it's 
I'm a very big lover of manga and I read a lot of varied titles. So I've constantly been studying, absorbing techniques and tropes and and ways to do things. And I get to show my knowledge in the form of my own book. And that is fun as well. Mm. Yeah, one of the things, uh, one of your much uh, pieces of merch that I like the most is the the glow in the dark tea. Yes, those are cool. Yeah. It's such a cool idea. It's just like I don't think there's enough just t-shirts in general that have glow in the dark in ink in yeah. them. Whenever I see them, I just think that is so cool. So, yeah. um, well, again, I mean, for me, it's 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 kind of just an extension of my musical artistry. It's it's me just saying, well, look, when it comes to music, I'm different. And I do things in a different way, and yes, you know, everybody raps, but here is how I do it in my own way, and in the same vain everybody well not everybody but anybody who has merch will have t-shirts but here's how i do t-shirts mm. yeah exactly and, and you've got so many other cool ones i know you've got like a foil one as well and just yeah the, yeah um well i've got the foil well what i've been leaning into more now actually because um of the work that i i put into with my illustrator to develop the artwork for the singles i've started selling art prints of the singles uh which are foil art prints and so that's been really cool just to reimagine my artwork as something that you could put on your wall mm -hmm. yeah and it works very well i mean i know not all of the people who are watching on youtube and things will be able to see some of the some of uh the artwork you've got in the background then i can see the uh nani one up there as well and the yes, cover of yeah. your manga obviously not everything that people can see because there's i can see there's a very cool dragon ball z one which yeah, yeah. is not your it's That's not, not yours unfortunately yeah. <laughs> but it does work and it's i think it was um I can't remember who said it, but um, before I've spoken to you and things, I've heard other people say what you ideally want for merchandise is you want it to be cool enough that your fans enjoy it, obviously you want to buy it, but also so that even if one isn't necessarily a super fan of the music, because the merch is so cool, you're willing to wear that. And then obviously cleverly enough, if yeah. people wear your stuff, that's a subtle advert for it. And if people go, yes, oh, that's is. a cool glow in the dark top. What's that? Oh, it's Shadow. Oh, who's that? And it it kind of goes yeah. from there. It's about recognition, which is something that totally. I think, and exposure, which is something that especially uh, artists that are building uh, a life for themselves in this industry really need. Mm, mm. No, totally agree. Totally agree. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and again, it's it should be an extension of your personality as an artist, you know? So as I've always said, I would, I would not make, say, a, f a football jersey um, as merchandise because... I have no interest in football. Same. So it, 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 just, it just wouldn't work for me. And I feel a lot of my fans wouldn't resonate with it because my fans are, are quite similar to me mm -hmm. in terms of their interests and their, 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 their dislikes and their likes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. It's knowing the fan base and also being true yeah. to yourself. That's and that's that's one of the things I've always liked about you is that you are very honest and mm. both in and outside of your music. As I, I harken back to the live show that I saw of yours, where just the way you interacted with the crowd, it was not superficial. And I think I think Tech Nine has a lot of that as well, which is one of the reasons I love tech as well. It's just that kind of open honesty, letting people see the true you and not having this, you know. I think a lot of artists, both in rap and outside of rap, have that kind of thing where they've got their rap or other persona at the front and then they are in the back. And although they're kind of pulling the strings, it's not truly who they are. And with you, I know that just from the start, you can pick out any Shadow track and you immediately know and you can feel what kind of individual you are, both mm. as an artist and as a person, which I really respect. And I think in the, the sort of, as you deemed it, nerdcore genre, I think that's what a lot of people like. I, I identify as a nerd as well. I mean, in the background, there's a Lego. Yeah, I, can see. I, was, I was looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got Lego everywhere, Funko Pops and stuff, and Star Wars tattoos and whatever. So, but it's it's one of those things where nerdy. I think a lot of people who are in nerd culture, either consumers or creators, they respond to honesty because yeah. for the longest time, nerds were kind of looked Watch down upon. Space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's become a bit more mainstream. I mean, accepted, look, we, yeah. we're grown. We're grown people, you know. Um, mm -hmm if you want to enjoy something which is perceived to be for kids and that's, that's up to you because I, I, I genuinely think that the ones who are, who are ridiculing others for having nerdy um, interests are probably quite miserable themselves because they're so worried about what other people think of them that they can't just enjoy what they want to enjoy, you know? And quite frankly, I'm in the gym so much that I'd like to see somebody try and stuff me in a locker. <laughs> <laughs> 
I have seen, and it also works really well because you wear a lot of the gym clothes, which are like sort of uh, the Dragon Ball Z style ones. Yeah, yeah. And whenever I see them, I'm like, I wish I was, I had the body to wear something like that that didn't look ironic. <laughs> but when well, you I mean, wear it, it's you like can, you can. You just have to hit the gym. Just, just <laughs> hit the gym, and you know, we we all can, we all can get it. Um, you know, and I I just want to. I feel like an anime character when I'm in the gym, so I want to look like one as well. Yeah, and your videos on uh, social media are very inspiring. Uh, the one that I watched uh, fairly recently, um, it was, I think it's the pectoral flight, where it's the machine where you're doing this. And I look, I could see in the background the weights going up, and it was the whole, all of the weights. And yeah. obviously, I was seeing that. I was like, I, I knew you were strong because I've seen a lot of the, um, and very athletic, I've seen a lot of the videos where, you know, you pull yourself up with your body weight and you can hold yourself up and things like that. But then when you see that sort of stuff, it's like this guy, he releases music. He's got manga out. He's a, a nerd in all the best ways. He's honest. And also, he goes to the gym a lot. And it's all these these elements that I think people would wrongly uh, not associate. They think, yeah. oh, if you love anime, you're going to be, the stereotypical term, it's like a neck beard, like an overweight person in a basement eating just Doritos and Mountain Dew, and that's it. And you've got no talent. Whereas I like how you are so unashamedly yourself and you do what you want to do in so many aspects and you're open about that on social media mm. that people get to see that you can be these things that in the past people wouldn't think connect together because it's, yeah. it doesn't matter. It's just what you want to be. Well, I mean, to be fair, I am in a basement and I, I'm eating barbecue crunch mix, with, <laughs> um, giant corn, peas and chickpeas. I but, eat that a uh, lot. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> exactly yeah nothing wrong with that i mean i eat a lot of i mean doritos are my are my thing i can i devour doritos i need to not have them in the house because i will just i'll go through yeah. them like nobody's business um so i want to ask a little bit about uh, something i noticed in you had an a interview in a magazine recently and you posted it yes. i saw on your facebook and things and within that i believe it was um i think it was mentioned in passing about sort of speaking at parliament and grassroots and i i can't remember when we spoke before if that was on the cards but i don't remember hearing uh, a huge amount of detail about that so apologies if it's now slightly out of date but i'm just intrigued by when did you speak with parliament and what was it kind of about that's a good question i'm actually trying to remember when it happened i feel like it was i think it was 2017 mm, actually yeah. but i have a really bad habit of forgetting stuff that i've done mm. like i could have done the coolest thing and then next month i'll be like yeah um yeah, i haven't really done much recently so. <laughs> Because uh, I, I, I'm always focused on the the now as well as the future and thinking about, okay, what can I do to to surpass what I've done already? So once I've done it, even the Tech 9 thing, I need to be reminded that I've been on a Tech 9 album because otherwise I forget because I'm so focused on what can I do to be better than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, with the, with the Parliament thing, it was I, I was speaking on behalf of small music venues around the country in support of and talking about how important culturally uh, grassroots music venues are, not only to the music scene, but to uh, small towns and cities and just ed entertainment and culture in general, you know, mm. how vital they are um, and how we don't, whilst the O2 academies and the, the O2 itself and the big massive venues are, are good, um, we still need smaller venues. We still need 100 capacity. We still need 200 capacity. In some cases, we need 50 capacity venues. Um, so, and that that is the training grounds for a lot of tomorrow's success stories. And without them, I don't know how you get your stage experience. I don't know how you learn how to command a crowd or how to um, take control of a vibe and, and enhance it with your music. You know, you can't just step on to an a thousand capacity stage for your first performance and expect to know what you're doing. You're meant to mess up in the smaller venues and then get better and build your, 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 your fan base who love you and, and be able to look them in the eye when you're performing and talk to them afterwards and stuff like that. You don't get that experience when you're doing an arena tour or a massive venue. 100%. And also for as a fan, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of venues uh, local to me because I'm from Southampton, as I said, and you played a, a show here recently. And Southampton, one of the things I love about it is the music scene. Uh, both There's the alternative music scene and the sort of the more mainstream. You've got the O2 Academy, uh, which is, you know, generally a bit more mainstream individuals who play there. But then you've got you've got the Joiners and you've got uh, the Brook and you've got a lot of other smaller venues and the stage door where as a fan especially when i was a teenager i would just spend every weekend i'd be going to a different gig of different genres and things and when you go to somewhere like uh the joiners as an example 
the tickets there are often less than ten pounds. So as someone who, if you're a young person or someone who is even older but doesn't have that much money to be able to spend fifty plus quid on a ticket to see a band or artist you like in an arena, plus getting there, etc., when it is that lower amount of money, it helps the obviously the venue itself, the local community, as well as the individual performing and also the individuals going there. So I think that what you say is something that I feel is very understated because I don't you don't hear about a lot of musicians speak about these things i feel as much you a lot of musicians when they get to a certain level they don't acknowledge almost where they came from in a lot of yeah. ways yeah yeah agreed um so regardless i mean that is why those small venues are important because we wouldn't i don't think we'd have those big musicians if not for the small venues so they should be protected and they should be respected in the same way that one respects say the out the royal albert hall but mm -hmm. the problem that we're having is a lot of small music venues are closing down um for a multitude of reasons um one being that aggressive developers are building apartments and houses and things like that close to music venues then when they're built people move in and start making start registering noise complaints because surprise surprise you live next to a live music venue what do you expect <laughs> Um, so there needs to be a recognition of that and perhaps some sort of protection put in place that if you decide you are going to build something next to an existing venue, you've either got to front up the cost for noise, um, cancelling, um, material with, within the walls of, of the residency, or you've just got to accept that it's going to be noisy sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. and Furthermore, uh, something that's killing a lot of these venues is uh, business rates, because many of them are treated like normal businesses when effectively most of them are not even turning a profit because either not enough people are coming through or it's a labor of love. So, you know, they're bringing acts through, uh, not because it's going to make them a lot of money, but because they want them to perform in their city. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can be charging uh, a, a live music venue business rates when they're not really operating as a business. They're not quite a charity either, but they're certainly not a, a proper business in terms of the fact that profit is not their main concern. Mm. Yeah, it's very well put. Yeah, I agree with you completely on that. Um, and we're getting towards the end um, of our well, of the hour uh, and things, so I will start to wrap up here. But um, there was something I wanted to ask you, and I should have asked you before recording, so apologies. Um, but it was well, obviously when we last spoke, your name was Shaldo as one word, mm -hmm. and now you've made it separate. And when I saw that, I went back and changed uh, the titles and things. I just wanted to ask, was that just because people, I know there was there was a joke, and you've, you've made the joke in songs and also in interviews where people think it's Shadow. Mm -hmm. um, was that part of the reason that you changed it out of interest that was entirely the reason i I'm, <laughs> I'm incredibly i'm incredibly stubborn and i was like no it is the children that is wrong not not i um <laughs> but then eventually i think i just got to the point where i was really tired of people mispronouncing my name and not re not realizing that i had an o in it so i thought well how can i make this more obvious and you know of course branding is important and if people are not recognizing how to properly spell my name or not understanding it then it's only it's only me that's suffering you know mm. I'm, I'm cutting off my nose despite my face ultimately so um i had to had to humble myself a little bit and just think well what is my ultimate goal here is it to is it to ensure that everybody says my name the way i want it to be said or is it to ensure that people actually know what my name is properly so they can find me um so i thought very long and hard about how i could present my name in a way which would be coherent and and readable but still maintain the authenticity and i tried you know symbols between the names and all sorts of things and this was over the process of about i thought about this for probably about a year to two years before i actually made the decision so it wasn't a quick decision i even thought about just dropping the dough and and just making it shout and that was a serious consideration for a while and the only thing that stopped me actually was um that there were other artists called shout hmm. and I considered, and I mean, none of them had the kind of reach and fan base that I did. So it would have been very easy to just go, you know what, this is my name now. And I'm, you've got to change yours mm. because I said so. And, you know, if you don't like it, I'll start legal action. Mm -hmm. I could have done that, but that felt really shitty. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't feel like the way I wanted to start a new name change to come in with animosity and, and negativity and stuff like that. Cause I feel that would, come back to me at some point later in my career I had to have my name surrounded with that so 
Shaudo was still me and very much me and nobody thankfully has ever tried to to take that name or to do something similar to that name probably because it's a stupid name uh, but um so you know I was free to play around with that and of course a lot of my merch still has Shaudo on it so I didn't want to completely disregard where I've come from so eventually I, I was just mucking around and I put a space between it and thought actually that doesn't look too bad that kind of works it then makes it very clear that these are two separate things you're meant to say and it's not shadow despite the fact that people still kind of say shadow sometimes it's less it's less they they tend to say shao dao now mm. which <laughs> you know we're, we're getting there not quite there but we're, we're certainly closer than we were so um yeah i think the space worked and actually now when i see the 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 word together in my brain i'm like no that's wrong you've spelled my name wrong despite the fact that that was my name for a good what like eight years or so so um it's weird how that works but it feels so much more natural having it like that and i can play around with it a lot more and and yeah people people are getting it and it, it just so happened that i changed my name just before i released nani so i don't know if the name change helped i don't know if it just was a fortuitous situation who you know i'll never know but it, it kind of it felt like the stars aligned at that point so it, it's definitely felt like the right thing to do there yeah when you did it I, th- I thought it was a good shout as well it was you know as i already knew who you were but when i was telling people about it if i write if you write shaldo without the space there is that part of people and they go is he just writing shaldo and got it wrong but when it's yeah. the space it's, it's like i highly doubt he's added an extra letter capitalized the d and you know, put yeah. O in it all by mistake. Yeah. And, and so it and it works as well because when I speak to people about you and when I have done before the the name alteration, it still it sounds the same. And even when we did our podcast, we're both saying Shaudo, but mm. it's difference between Shaudo and Shaudo. It's like the, the yeah. it's almost the tiniest little gap difference. Yeah. So I think it works really, really well. And it was it was a good shout, I think. Um, I hadn't thought about it, but when you did it, I was like, yeah, that, that yeah. makes sense. It, it felt like the most obvious thing. And sometimes the simplest solution is the, is the right one sometimes, but I still had to think about it very carefully because Definitely. it's, it's my, it's, it's my everything really. So hundred percent. Cool. Well, um, last sort of thing I want to ask you is just what can you tell us for sort of with the future? Obviously you've got um, a lot of things going on at the moment and there's, I'm sure many things that you can't speak about. Um, but in your answer of what you can tell us, I know that there's something that uh, in it, a week or so after this being uh, released, it sh- will be out. So I want you to speak about that. But yeah. also in that answer, I'm very intrigued by how far ahead are you with things? Um, so like, for example, what you're releasing next week, have you already started writing the next thing and the next thing after that? Or are you, you know, I know you said one single at a time. I'm just intrigued by the process of how far ahead you are with stuff mm. that you can actually talk about. And also what's the thing coming out next week? Yeah. So um, in answer to that question, no, just because my brain, because I do so much myself, my brain switches into different modes. So currently I'm in single p- um, promotion mode and that is a very business orientated um way of thinking with some flares of creativity granted, but it is a lot more business orientated. So it just, my, I, I'm not thinking about writing lyrics just because I can't think about writing lyrics right now. I'm very much focused on ensuring that as many people as possible know about the single and pre-save it as well, because that kind of thing helps, you know, it, uh, I, I don't think people realize, but the more that a single is pre-saved before the release, the more likely it is that that single will then be put onto playlists and things like that which of course helps the artist um in terms of more plays and more listens and more potential listeners you know so um yeah my focus is just ensuring that as many people as possible know that i have new music coming out so that on release day there are people ready to listen and check it out um in terms of after that once that song is out i'll probably give myself a few days to a week and then i'll get back to writing again and start planning the next track alongside that though i am you know i say that I, I can't write anything. And that's kind of not true because I am still also working on part three of Shaggy Ball Z versus One Jump Man and also um, creating the um, second volume of The Way of Shao Manga. And I'm actually expecting, well, this is releasing on Sunday, but, well, potentially releasing on Sunday, but as we are now we're on a Wednesday, I'm expecting some drafts of the book tomorrow to have a look at. So I'm really excited to see that. Um, Plus, yeah, just more shows. And uh, I've got a show next month in Cambridge. I am performing at all of the Comic-Con events this year in in England. So I'm doing the two London shows and the, and the Birmingham show. And 
yeah, whatever else kind of comes up in between that. Sometimes things just pop up and they're huge and they come out of nowhere. So I'm, I'm always kind of just open for experiences, I guess, and just new things. And then I'm also trying to be as supportive to the up and coming artists as possible. So, you know, I've, I've, I occasionally do Twitter spaces where I just hop in and just give advice to artists. I'm strongly considering starting up a, a kind of side business of uh, mentoring and advising artists where, you know, maybe I'll, I'll charge a small amount per hour and I'll sit down and listen to a, 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 an artist's music, give them advice. And that's directly tailored to them and help them to learn the music industry. Um so yeah, I'm, I'm considering that. I haven't, I haven't quite thought it out just yet because there's so many other things to do. But yeah, essentially, there's always stuff that I'm doing, you know, yeah. and it will, it will always be creative in some way. Yeah, and one, and it goes back to one of my very first comments of back to the other podcast. One of the UK's hardest working rappers because you are <laughs> you're always doing something and it is always just delightful to speak with you because there's always so many things to talk about and although this one was more confined uh, to an hour I feel like you know we didn't even touch with like anime or anything like that because the last conversation we had was the majority of it was just talking yeah. about Dragon Ball Z and Dragon Ball Super yeah. so I know we could talk about hundreds of things um, but before I press uh, stop on this wonderful conversation. Please tell people uh, where they can find you. I'll put links in the description, but just sort of last things and uh, what you've got. I'll make sure this comes out on Sunday. So what you've got coming out within the week, and then we'll finish this up. Sure. So you can find me on pretty much any social media at Shadow Music. So S-H-A-O-D-O-W Music. Um, if you can't spell music, I can't help you. <laughs> and my website is DIYgang.co.uk, as it sounds. Um, I have the Evan Yeager Fidead uh, track coming out on friday the 8th even though it says the 4th on my twitter it is actually the 8th because i just i'm dumb and twitter doesn't have an edit button <laughs> um so yeah that's coming out next friday and it is what it sounds like it's an Evan jaeger diss track because he is a psychopath and i refuse to <laughs> refuse to accept any other um answer to that and um yeah i'll also be um involved in a dungeons and dragons playthrough uh it'll be my first time playing dungeons dungeons and dragons and that will be going up on youtube i think we're doing that on saturday um so i'm really looking forward to checking that out and trying that out so yeah look out for that as well i'll be promoting that when it comes out and i'm performing in cambridge next month for the sound and vision festival incredible yeah and i'll be sure uh, to share some of those things as well that you've been uh, involved with and it's it works out quite well because i've been talking i've been trying to think about having you on for months and then just mm. kind of this just fell into place very nicely and then yeah. it's like oh you've got a single coming out and obviously uh shaggy ball z uh, shaggy ball z part two very recently just dropped and you've got as you said the way of the shao manga part two that's kind of in sort of some of the final stages of that as mm. well so lots of very exciting things for 2022 for shaldo and um yeah it's just been absolutely delightful speaking with you again i really appreciate you taking your time out of this evening and i really hope that anyone who hasn't already checked out not only our other conversation but more specifically your music i need people more people to just that's what this podcast is all about is highlighting you as an artist and getting as many people to listen to you as possible and because i just think you're an amazing individual both in and outside of music so thank just thank you for being you releasing what you are and i'm very excited for the coming years thank you very much well it's a pleasure to talk to you as always <laughs> thank you very much